Hey guys, uh, great episode for you today. This is Tito Torres. He is near Miami, Florida. Tito's been in our program for quite a few months now. And at our live event in Fort Lauderdale, he won the consistency award. He shows up every week. He's calm, cool, collected. He's got a great head on his shoulders. He started his business from scratch, from zero. He has a beautiful office space down there in Florida. He's grown his business. Um, he's made some amazing decisions, changing business model, raising price. He's done really, really amazing things. And he's someone that I truly admire. And it's an honor to have him in our program. And I was honored to get to spend a little time with him, interview him, talk through it. He's just an amazing, humble guy. And uh, I know you're going to enjoy this episode. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Business School for the Rehab Chiropractor. Class is officially in session. My name is Justin Rabinowitz, and I am a rehab chiropractor on a mission to teach you, a fellow rehab chiropractor, the exact tools and systems I've used to build my own successful rehab chiropractic practice so you can do the same. I hope you enjoy, and please subscribe. All right, Tito, so start us, uh, start us off. Go back to graduation and then how we got to your current practice and then take us through the journey and then I'll I'll pepper you with questions. Yeah, so I graduated in September 2021 and I moved to Fort Lauderdale, Florida and decided to open up my practice here. So it's been a year and a half. Okay. So you, so you graduate school and then, um, you know, we have a lot of people in your position, also new grads or people in school. Uh, What was it that you said, I'm going to definitely do my own thing. Yeah. I mean, I've loved business ever since I was in, in high school. I mean, Shark Tank was around then. It's still like always around now, but it was something that I looked forward to once a week. And that kind of made me fall in love with like the business aspect. And then I obviously fell in love with like health, fitness and helping other people. But in terms of like the business, I've, I always knew that I wanted to open up a business. I fell in love with it since I was in high school. Then college, I always liked it. And I started taking like mentorship business. Like I was in groups ever since I was in quarter two of, of Cairo school. So I've always knew that I wanted to open up on my own just because I'm kind of combining both my passions, right? Health, fitness, and then business. And that's kind of what got me to open it up straight out of school. So you're, uh, you're from Puerto Rico and and now you're in Fort Lauderdale. A lot of people that open up right out of school oftentimes go back to their hometown just because you know people and it's familiar. Was that ever like scary moment for you? Like I don't know anyone here and I'm opening up my own business. Yeah. So, I mean, I moved out of Puerto Rico when I was 17 to Mobile, Alabama and I played college baseball there. So, I mean, that was more of a culture talk, a culture shock uh, than like Fort Lauderdale. So I've always, like I moved to Mobile, Alabama, didn't know anyone and things ended up pretty good there. And then I moved to Daytona Beach, Florida. That's where I went to Cairo school and things ended up pretty good there as well. So moving to Fort Lauderdale, whenever like not knowing anyone, like I've been through it in the past. So it wasn't really that challenging just moving somewhere new and not knowing anyone just because I've done it two other times. So I want to get into the business model in a sec, kind of before you started with us and after, but before we do that, um, one of the things that's unique in your situation is is as most rehab chiros, when they get their business going, they, they rent a room in a gym. You know, I've done it. I have multiple practices that do it. You are unique in that you rented like a proper office to get started. Uh, Talk us through that decision-making process. You know, how did you find the location? Why did you get the big office? Tell us about that. Yeah. So first, a couple of things. This wasn't my first location. My first location was inside of a hair salon. Okay. I didn't even know that. Tell me about that. It was in a small eight by eight hair salon because, I mean, things in South Florida, like it's pretty expensive real estate right here. And it was like a small eight by eight room. And I had my portable table. I had some kettlebells. I had a small desk. And I mean, I kind of made it work. I had a barber on one side and a nails, hair stylist on the other side. And I mean, I was definitely the only chiropractor there. How long were you there for? For about five, four to five months. I mean, it was like, I made it work. There's not like, I I needed a table and some 
empty space and I got it. So, okay, good. And so what made you, what made you say like, all right, I got to get a a proper space. So this was like, so I got the proper space in January of last year. And then while waiting for permits and while waiting for everything to kind of move in, I kind of wanted to start because I was just tired. I was working at the joy part-time at the time, but I just kind of wanted to start. I had been networking and I had been doing like marketing and it was like, people are like, Hey, I'm like ready now. Can you see me? I was like, not yet. And I just got tired of waiting. So I just did, I just went to people's houses like in February. And then in March, I rented out the space or I like rented the room. And from March until July, I was there. So four or five months. So that's basically the transition of not having anywhere to be, to going to people's houses, to going to like the hair salon. I got it. Cool. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on it because it's honestly a little bit boring, though. We haven't talked about it on the podcast. Um, You mentioned permits. You mentioned, you know, build outs and landlords and and that type of thing. And and it isn't something that we've gone into, but I think that a lot of people out there, if they haven't, you know, signed a lease and negotiated it, it's like, oh, I'm going to go find a lease and I'll move in next week. Walk us through the process of it, you know, in your situation, because, you know, it sounded like it took a few months, but for people out there that either have opened their practice in a gym and are going to look or haven't opened yet, uh, it's good to go into it with your eyes wide open. Yeah. It's honestly, it's a big risk to be honest. And at the time I wasn't under your mentorship and just based on what I, the information that I had, everything that I had learned, I thought this was the best path for me. If I wanted to kind of grow and scale without anything in my way. Um, But it's a lot of risk to be honest. And it's, it's a headache at first, right? Cause you have to focus on, marketing and sales, but now you also have to focus on being a landlord, right? So it's having focus on that takes away from it. But I think like the way that I mitigated that risk was just finding other people, right? So at the very beginning for the first seven to eight months, I had a personal trainer. He's still here with me and we share the gym space. And then I was subleasing to a massage therapist and they were in the other room and the massage therapist is no longer with us. And now we have a pelvic floor PT in that room. Um, So that's kind of how I mitigate the risk in terms of the whole process of permitting. It's a really, it's a pain in the ass Mm -hmm. of more than I was expecting. Everybody told me that it it was going to take longer than I was planning. And it did. Mm. Um, I was planning on moving in there by March, April, and I ended up moving in July. So it was challenging and stressful, but after I moved, it was just like, okay, now we're moved. Now it's just marketing sales. Yeah, no, it's a good point. We actually had a similar path. It might've been around the same time when we bought our space, but same thing. You know, we, I think we thought we were going to be in in like March or April and we ended up not getting in until July. Um, luckily the place where we were before it was our month to month agreement and we have, we had a good relationship with the guy. And so he kind of just said, you know, whatever you need to do, just let me know. And I think even when I left, cause it was sort of short notice, I paid him an extra month's rent just to, you know, keep preserve the relationship. But to that point, you know, I think people that are getting started or again, they've got their practice going, they're doing well and they want to expand to start kind of playing chess, not checkers. Like what is that next step? You know, if you, if you, oh, we're going to move in in May, it's like, all right, we'll plan on being there July 4th, right? So you better have a place for see your patients May, June, potentially July, because it might not be as smooth of a transition as you, as you once hoped. So, you know, that, that piece of advice, just to give people, you know, listening to this, a little bit of pause, caution to say, all right, like I'm going to go take this on. And, you know, uh, not that it's like you said, it's not a bad thing. It's just kind of go in with eyes wide open. I think the next thing, um, which goes back into marketing, it's a marketing exercise. If you, if someone reached out to me today, like kind of like you did, but you were already doing it and I say, I have this big space and it's like, I got these rooms that aren't being used. What do I do? It's I think 
being able to become sort of the landlord and have people rent rooms from you for a, the time being is a great is a great uh, idea. Um, but we're seeing it right now in our group, you know, it's sometimes it is inconsistent. People come and go like you lost your massage therapist and it becomes an exercise in marketing. It's just not marketing for new patients, it's marketing for tenants. And so, um, you know, has that been a challenge for you to keep those rooms rented? Uh, not really. Uh, luckily, right. I got really lucky with the personal trainer cause he introduced me to the massage therapist mm-hmm. and then both of them kind of came at the same time. And then once we, lost a massage therapist, then I knew this pelvic floor PT and she had just started her practice like about a year ago and she was looking for part-time space. I was like, Hey, I have this room. It's like, it can be yours. There's a gym. It's better. It's a lot more. She was like outgrowing, going to people's uh, places. Just yeah. So she's here part-time, but I got really lucky and I'm trying to find another part-time person to be there. And that's been a bit more challenging. Yeah. Just because people that want it part time, uh, it's just there's not as much commitment, at least from the people that I have found to where it's like they just want a place they want to pay by the hour, not like permanent. And that's more more of a headache. Right. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think you did get lucky um, the way that I had my first space for four years was I was a tenant at that point, but I went to a a tennis center that I, that I thought used to have space. And, and it turns out that the guy had left and moved somewhere else. The lady at the front desk took my name down and then the guy called me and said, I have a room. And so did I get lucky? Sort of, but I was on the hunt, so to speak, just like you were like, these are relationships that you created. So it isn't that you got lucky in finding a tenant. It's that because you are doing the networking and making relationships that you have connections and contacts with people. So that when in this situation you have an opening, um, you can, you can fill it. So, you know, you're, you're not a hermit in your office. So it almost like, I think luck is almost not giving yourself credit for all of the work that you have done, uh, t- to be able to, to fill that room and, and pay some of the rent and take some of the burden off, off the, off of yourself right now. So that's great. Um, so let's go, let's go back a little bit and talk business model. So we met, uh, I, I don't know, it's like not, not quite a year ago, but you were in business already over, I think around a year and talked to me about your business structure, potentially how long you were seeing patients, what, what your thoughts were about business at that point and how the business was doing. And then we'll sort of progress forward and some of the changes and thought processes that have changed. Yeah. So whenever you and I first met, it was June cause I was about to move in into this space and I was waiting for like final inspections and all that. And at the time when we, you and I first talked, I was really wanting to do like the clinic gym hybrid Mm -hmm. basically. Um, And after learning and after doing, after just learning just business and how I can optimize my time, my value, uh, I kind of realized that maybe the clinic gym hybrid wouldn't be ideal for my cash-based model, right? And we talked about how people that go to the gym typically are funneled from the clinic, but as us clinicians, we are not like high volume, right? So it's a lot more challenging to fill up the gym if I don't have that many patients in the clinic, just because our business model is not set up that way. So I kind of had to uh, pivot Right. And then I just started doing, I was doing 30 minute appointments at the time. Yeah. Let me, let me pause you before we get to the 30 minutes. Cause I, th- I think there's some nuance here and, um, and you know, the first thing that I'll say is Josh Satterley, who does clinic gym hybrid is a mentor of mine. And, and he's been a big help in my career. And I think it's a phenomenal, phenomenal model. The thing that Tito, that you and I spoke about is that specifically if you're a startup in a cash-based setting, one of the concerns is that there might not be enough patient volume to come in the door to then funnel into the gym. And so for me, it wasn't a a never, it was a potentially not yet because my biggest concern with a lot of new, new docs, but really new business owners is that they're trying to focus on two things. It's hard to run a rehab chiropractic practice. It's hard to run a gym. It's really hard to do both at the same time to start up 
very well. And for me, it was a, it was a focus conversation of like, can we, can we just get the one thing off the ground, get that to be successful? And then, you know, as I always teach you guys, it's about having choices. Like, what about if we have the choice at that point where you've built this practice, it's throwing off cash, uh, you are stepping out of treatment, you want to go explore the gym thing? Great. Right. But to potentially at that point, you know, in my opinion, it was just too much. Um, too soon. And, and the thing that, um, that I want to go back to again and, and just reiterate is uh, you do need a certain amount of volume coming in in order to, to fill a gym. And, and if you're going to run a gym, just, just back into it and say, all right, I want to run a semi private training model. I want to have at four or five people per session. They're going to pay me two to three hundred dollars a month. How many of those people on monthly memberships do I need to make it worth my time? I don't know. Pick a number 20, 30, 40 people. Okay. So then I've got to hire coaches. Then I've got to make sure I have the time slots available. Then I get in the customer service game. And so I'm not saying it's not a bad, it's, it's a great business, but it's a, it's, I always say you have to respect the business, respect the, the, what you're getting yourself into. So, you know, when, when we, and, and you and I spoke about it, um, it, it was a, it's a great opportunity. It just might not be Tito's opportunity today. Yeah. Right. And so, Talk through the next thing because we hear because we work through that a lot. You were you were doing thirty minute appointments and if, and share what you were charging at the time and sort of you know where we've gone to and and what you've seen through that process. Yeah, so at the time whenever we were we first talked, uh, I started at thirty minute appointment for eighty dollars a visit. Mm-hmm. Then I think whenever you and I first talked, I had just upped it to one hundred dollars a visit, mm-hmm. and I remember. I remember the first time I upped it from 80 to 100, I hopped on a call with you that same day. I was like, yeah, I kind of had some bad luck because I had my last three patients said no at 100. And I was like, yeah, I think it's just like, I I think I just might be a little bit too expensive. And then you looked at me, it was like, it's not that. You just need to communicate better and communicate your value. Now looking back at it, I was like, well, yeah, 100%. Um, talk through that a little bit. Cause you know, we've, we've run into that in different, whether it's asking for charging the right price. And so I think that'll be super valuable. Oh, uh, talk about just so, like, you know, thinking, thinking it was just the price that was the problem, but it was just the communication of the, it could have been 50, it could have been 80, it could be a hundred, it could be 300. The almost, the prices was, was the 20%, the 80% is how we communicate it and, and how yeah. you felt about communicating it. Yeah. Basically the way I like to like, Think about price and value. I know Hormozy, he gives out, he kind of simplified it for me. And it was like the value to price discrepancy, he calls it, right? That people say no whenever the price is higher than the value that they get. So you just want to present them with the price whenever you know that the value is higher. Because at that point, they'll always say yes, right? right? So it's like, for people to say yes, you can do one of two things. You can either increase the value or decrease the price. I just increase the price without increasing any value. So, because when you say that, most people listening will say, oh, like, what does that mean? You don't have shockwave or you don't have some sort of therapy or you're, you changed as a practitioner. But but what do you mean by that, uh, the value that you're providing? So, it's... It's not more or less the value. It's like the perceived value, what they perceive as valuable. But I wasn't doing a good job in communicating what kind of value I can provide that they haven't gotten where anywhere else, basically. It's just, it was just basically a communication issue as to how they perceive that value. So, so what you're saying is someone comes in to see you. Potentially, they used their insurance before or they've gone to another provider that was charging And now all of a sudden they show up in Tito's office and he's saying, I'm charging you 100. And the patient's saying, I don't understand. You're doing the same thing as the guy down the street. Why would you charge 100 for for the same thing? Correct? Yeah, basically. And so just to give it context for our audience, you know, in our programs, we call that, you know, value for unique solution. And to go into uh, the metaphor that I always talk about, it's, um, if I presented two cars to you, one was 5,000 and one was 20,000 and I get, that's all the information that I gave you. Of course you should just choose the cheaper option because when we have no, nothing else, no other context available, we should, we usually do choose, choose the cheapest option. 
in this situation, essentially what we had to do was say, okay, one car is 5,000, one car is 20,000. But the 20,000 one will get you to work reliably. The tire's not flat. It's got an airbag. Your kid's not going to fall out the back seat. It's got a full gas tank. It's the oil's been changed. It's not rusty. And all of a sudden it's going to be like, all right, like I'm willing to pay more because there's more value in that car. And so if we take that into our own practice, um, and this goes with any price points, and we'll talk about the progression from there, you know, if if the patient on the one end, they might not be cheap, it might not be they want to use their insurance, it might simply be that they can, they don't understand yet why they should pay more, because right now they just see it as the same thing. So so what what happened after that? So I said it's not the price, and then what was sort of your learning and going back? You know, what how did you progress forward to kind of keep moving along? It was just getting better at communicating my worth my worth with them, my worth yeah my worth to them. Yep. And so how different of an experience they'll have here with what they had in the past, basically. And so give us some examples. So um, what, what are some things either you said to them or how you said it for them to understand like, oh, this will be different. So I feel like almost everything changed in terms of like specific examples. I was just, I was just like, they were coming for the new patient. And then I would just, I don't even know like a specific example, just because it was like almost a complete 180 in terms of like my communications. Mm-hmm. Um like they would come in how I used to do it. They would just come in and I would just talk straight clinical with them. I would just be like, you have this, this is what we need to do. Instead of focusing on like the individual, getting to know them personally, get creating more of a relationship. Right. And then once I have that relationship and trust, then they'll be able to trust me with what I have to say and what's best for them rather than, Hey, I just, can you adjust me real quick? Hey, can you do a massage real quick? Be like, Hey, that might not be the best option for you. And this is why. Right. And just having like that confidence and communication of just getting their trust first by getting to know them. And then once I earn their trust, being able to communicate, Hey, that thing didn't work what you did in the past because of this, this, and this, how about we try this and this is going to work because of this. No, I think it, I mean, you nailed it. I I think you absolutely nailed it and what you're saying. Um, And just to kind of, to recap a little bit of of what you are saying there, you know, we we live in a, we live in a world when we come out of school, we have so much knowledge, clinical knowledge, and the people in our mastermind, at least are, are really, really high level clinicians. And it's exciting that we can look at someone and be like, oh, we can definitely help them because of this, this, and this. And from a clinical perspective, a lot of us sort of look at the patient in front of us. We know where they've been in the past of the guy that just racked and cracked their back. And they, and you know, it isn't that complicated. They might need some core. They might need some hip hinging. They might need some mobility drills. And it isn't actually, we look at it and we're like, this isn't that complicated. We get so excited. And we start to like, tell them that like, Hey, we're just going to do this and this. And we just go clinical, 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 clinical. And what we realize is that, and this is kind of like the learning as we progress out of school is that all that clinical knowledge, even though we hold on to it and we still have it for the most part, the patient doesn't really care. They just want to know that you can get them an outcome and a result that they haven't gotten before. So that brings us to the next part of the conversation, which is what you alluded to, which was the trust. And so what I always tell people in our mastermind, I say, listen, my only job is to help you figure out how to communicate in a way that allows you the opportunity to help that person. At that point, I, I, I trust that you're going to figure it out because in our world of rehab chiros, I genuinely believe we are the best option from MSK care in our area. I, I genuinely believe that like anyone in within a five mile radius of your office, I believe should be in your practice. The problem is so many of us never get those people because we don't know how to communicate that in, in that way. It's something that I'm speaking about in the book, um, about that sales process. And people are so scared of sales and all that. And the sales is just the conduit to get us to the thing that we're actually good at. But the reason why so many of us get pissed is because people that you know that you could help 
they're going to the CBP guy or the subluxation guy or the whatever, not because they're better doctors. Everyone listening to this knows they're not. It's because those guys and girls have figured out how to speak in a way that helps the patient understand, that makes the patient trust them so that they say yes to that. And all I'm saying is like, we have to fight back a little bit here because if we truly believe we're better for these people, we've got to help them understand that. So um, I think that that dichotomy that you mentioned, the clinical, clinical, clinical to going, hey, let me get to know this person. Let me change this a little bit. I need to build trust and then I can go and do all the all the things and stuff that I that I did. So let's go. So you, so you got 80, you went from 80 to 100. And then what happened next? Um, so in terms of right now, I'm at uh, one hour and right now I'm at 295. And one changed in terms of going from 30 minutes to an hour. No, just in terms of uh, like, cause so many people like they're going to hear that and drive off the side of the road. Like, how did you do it? Uh, and I guess what I'm hinting at is yes, our skills are better. And yes, uh, a lot of things do change along the way to add value. But for the most part, a lot of times the hardest part is just doing it. Right. Yeah. So I'd say like one of the biggest mindset shifts that I've had has been on money and on sales. And I was like, I know you talk about them on the podcast quite often that our math, like, for example, if you charge $50 a session, but you see six people an hour, well, you make 300 an hour, right? With us, I was doing 80, right? And then times two, that's 160. The math just doesn't add up. And that's just not like business, right? And one thing that one thing that you taught us is like the math has to add up. Cause I on our first conversation, I know that you and I had talked. And if my schedule was completely full at a hundred a session, I would be making at the most that I would be able to make was like eleven grand, something like that. Right. So I would be making eleven grand after overhead. I'd be taking home whatever, like half of that, let's say, just a, let's say 6,000, right? Probably less. Probably less. And then to keep a full schedule, I can't manage that. So I'm going to have to hire someone. And then that's another two grand. And then to keep a full schedule, I'm going to have to spend money on marketing. That's yeah. less. So yeah. if my schedule was completely full, I'd be taking home a thousand or two thousand. And in yeah. South Florida, that's, that's, that's not even. I mean, that's anywhere that's studio. that's not good. But so 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 let's let's play that out because this this is brilliant. Um, so let's go one step further because you mentioned well, then I'll have to hire an associate. So here's some easy math for people. Different situations are different. I know that, but just people out there, like if you if you hire an associate, on average, they can make that associate can typically make a third a third of what they of what they bring in, and so all of a sudden. Now we said, all right, Tito can max out at 11,000. So let's just be generous and say it's 130,000, right? And let's take a third of 130,000. Now we start to understand why all Kairos as associates hate their life and why no one wants to stay. And as I've always said, like, I, I'd like to think that if you didn't meet me, Tito, you wouldn't have gotten there because you're, because you would look at the numbers and say, I can't do this. Though, what would happen, and this is true, you would hire an associate, they would come in, and you, who we know is not a jerk, is not cheap, and has no ill will towards people, but you would hire an associate, and that associate would say, Tito is cheap, he's an asshole, and he doesn't want to pay me. Yeah. It's actually not true. It's that the business can't afford to pay anymore. And this is the point that I think people don't get. It's that the, the pro we've created our own problems in this profession. And the, the biggest thing for me, which I want to shout on the rooftops and hopefully people hear me, is that even if it isn't for you, Tito, like let's say Tito, let's say you have a rich uncle and don't need to make the money, fine. But if you want to bring other people on into this business, whether it is another associate or an admin or whatever, like the, the path that so many people are going down, you know, the business model wise, it just isn't going to work. It's, it's not going to work. And then we're just going to perpetuate this thing. 
this thing over and over of associateship is bad. My boss is a jerk. I'm going to have to go up my own, but then you go open up your own and then you do the same thing. And it's just this never ending cycle. It's like, it's like, it's like being in an alcoholic family and then you're the alcoholic and then your kid's the alcoholic. It just perpetuates over and over. It's almost like you almost have to break the cycle. So the fact that you had that realization, um, out of all the success that you've had, to me, that might be the best one because we've we've kind of mitigated this and given you a chance to be successful, right? If I sent you to the batter's box with no bat, it's going to be really challenging to hit. Yeah. Where yeah. do you think that came from, though? Um, by the way, when I, I I'm asking you this question, when I opened, I was sixty dollars for half an hour. So the uh-huh. things that I preach are because I screwed it up just as well. But how do you think you got to that point of? Um, like I'm going to open up and I'm going to charge 80 for 30 minutes. Uh, wh- where did that come from? Yeah. Just because where our preceptor at the time, he was charging 85. And I was like, well, I can't charge as much as he can because he's been doing this for 10, 15 years. It's like, I got to be a little bit cheaper, but I was like, I don't want to be that much cheaper. So I just did 80. That's literally my thought process. And same amount of time though, 30 minutes. Oh, uh, he was doing uh, he was doing 15 and then he had interns in terms of me do the rehab for the other 15 minutes. So 30 minutes patient, but the car was doing 15. I was like, well, I'm doing the rehab. So I got to do 30 minutes and I can't be 85 or I can, but I don't want to be 85. So I just did 80. And that's, that's how I came up with $80. Yeah. Yeah. And but and again, as we as I walk through this, and and again, we I always say our job, my job is to just hopefully help less people. People don't make the same mistakes I did, and you being on this podcast, you're going to save someone. But at the most basic level, again, I, I know you're okay to have the conversation, but it's like, all right, eight, he was charging eighty five, and he was seeing four people an hour. I'm charging eighty and seeing two. It's it's base. It's quite basic, right? But but again, we all have are guilty of that, and I kind of joke with people, but I'm serious. It's like, guys, I literally have a business because that's the thought process sometimes, you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It just, it just makes absolutely no sense. And, uh, this podcast might put me out of business because people are gonna be like, Oh yeah, that's right. I don't need to talk to him anymore. Cause that's what he's going to tell me to do. Uh, may, maybe hopefully that happens. And then we have some better problems to solve. Um, but all right. So, so you charged, so you got to like a hundred bucks for 30 minutes. How did you progress up to the to the 295 was it incremental or you just ripped the bandaid off it was it was incremental i it's almost like like i wish i could have done it like from 100 to 295 but then i don't think i would have had the confidence to be like hey this is like what i'm worth Mm -hmm. so i like slowly did it it was a bit slower than expected it was almost like okay somebody said yes at 125 okay let me do 150 Mm -hmm. okay somebody said yes to 150 okay, I can do this. Let me do, do to 160. And then it was at 160 for 30 minutes that I like two straight people say yes. But then I, I found myself subconsciously, this is what made me go from 30 minutes to an hour, that a couple of things, I wasn't cluster booking people. I wasn't, I was leaving 30 minutes uh, open. Because I, open because I was running like 30 minute appointments would never be 30 minutes. It would be 40. And then I would still feel rushed and I felt like I needed more time. I was like, and then I didn't cluster book. And then at that point I knew I was like, okay, I can't like keep doing this. But I was like charging 30 minutes for like 160. And I was like back to like square one, which is like 160 an hour. Right. Just like, but, and then I decided to do one hour appointments. And then I went to 250 for and then I immediately, somebody said yes to 250 and then I went to 269 and then somebody said yes. And then I got to 295 basically. So I just let me ask it. you this. Do you, do you get a lot more pushback or no's at, at that price point than you did at 160 or 150 or 90? Like a lot more pushback or not really? Not really. Yeah. Well, that's what, that's always what I've seen. And, and I think one of the things coming into our, our mastermind group now with so much proof of success is that a lot of the newer members can sort of feed off of that statement right there. Um, because I've never, it's, it's always a scarier thing in our head to kind of get it, get where we need to be. But I've always said like when I charge 60 or when I charge 75 and I charge 95, now my skills were shit at that point. Like I didn't know any of this. I was just going, 
But I got people that said I was too expensive then. I got people that said I was expensive at 70, 90, 125, 150, like 200, like every price point. But it's no more now uh, then than it is now. Like we still get objections and we still get people that say no, but it was the same amount, right? Yeah. And so it's an interesting, it's an interesting sort of paradox that everyone, not everyone, most people that come into our world run into and they experience. And 10 out of 10 times, getting your prices where they need to be or raising price to an appropriate level so that you can run a good business is always a scarier proposition for us than it yeah. is for the patient because they don't know any different. Yeah. Yeah. One hundred percent. So, um, all right. So we've, we've grown the business. We're doing well. We're, we're, you know, we're solid. It's a stable business, but I know that, you know, you have big growth plans. You want to grow a business. You want to be a CEO, you know, what's it going to take to get there? Just consistency, just keep on, I feel like what I'm doing, just doing it for longer and getting better at it. I think that's pretty much like summarized into one sentence, just keep doing what I'm doing, but just better and longer. So let's, let's go uh, into some of the, you do a lot of networking, outreach and marketing. So take us through maybe a typical week or month of, of all the activity you're doing. And I think what I, what I want to highlight here is um, give people some context on like the amount of hustle that it does take. Yeah, it's, it's slowly, I'm still doing the same, but the amount of that I'm investing in terms of time, it's going more on one bucket than the other, just because I kind of, find out what works. And then we'll I talk, just talk through that. So maybe go back and say what are not, you don't say everything you tried, but what were the different buckets you were doing? And then as you progressed, what have you noticed that's been better? Yeah. So let's say seven months ago, I was in two chambers, BNI doing a lot of gyms. That was pretty much my main marketing that I was doing. Um, slowly like left off like chamber. It just didn't work for me and then slowly left off BNI. And then I started doing a lot more Instagram. And then I'd say like three months ago, it was a lot of, a lot of gyms and a little bit of Instagram. And then the last three months, it's almost like more, a lot more Instagram and a little bit less gyms just because I've been getting like the vast majority of my like leads on Instagram. And but in terms of like the gyms, it's I just it, it's a lot of time yeah. that I was putting there a week. Like I was blocking off Tuesday afternoons from five to eight, and I would just go work out at a different gym. And then Saturday mornings, I would try and go to like another gym, and then I would just kind of do Tuesdays and Saturdays. And then I was also going to a run club on Wednesday evenings. And that was just pretty consistent, like three times a week, just showing up and trying to create those relationships. How have you, what, what's your process for Instagram to actually make it work for you? Um, you know, because it's, it's one of those things that I don't know, polarizing isn't, isn't the right word, but where I see a lot of people go, they, they invest all of their time. And like, in your case, if it's working, it's like, yeah, like double down, triple down. But there are a lot of people that are just posting like shoulder press videos just because they think they should. And that's all they're doing. And they don't get patience from it. And it's like, all right, at some point we've got to change something. Do you have a process or is it kind of just like, you know, talk, talk us through the Instagram process. No. Yeah. It's definitely a process. I, I was struggling to show value and to what I do, like what we call value for unique solution. Yeah. Right? And you always like taught us, it's like a lot easier to show than tell. Mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, there's no, I don't think there's a better way to show than like on Instagram right now. So I was like, okay, let me learn the platform, see if it's good or if it's not. And then I actually bought a course from somebody. His name is, um, I'm Shakur Smith. He's like pretty, he's been like extremely helpful. And he actually, taught me a process mm -hmm. as to how I can basically get cold leads and then just from cold to warm to hot to basically a call. And then after our call, it's just like our process. Um, so have you found um, one of the issues that we see people run into is that they might, they might do something like that and get a lot of cold leads on digital, but they, 
then struggle with getting them in because they are so cold. Have you, how have you mitigated that or what have you learned from that? No. So like my Instagram leads are three times as hot as any other lead. They're like, cause they like the messages that I get from them are like, Hey, I've been to another chiropractor, but it seems like you're doing more and it seems like you're different. I think you'd be better off for me. And I've had, I currently have some low back pain and it's like, okay, well they clearly see value for any solution. So then I just get their information and then hop on a call. So, so, so you found that to be pretty, pretty really useful then. Yeah, no, it's, like it. it's almost like I'm doubling and tripling down on it mm-hmm. just because I save a lot more time and I can focus more on like higher level tasks rather than like driving to gyms and just meeting potentially 10 patients. And it's not to say that that's right. No, it just, for me, it's worked a lot more recently yeah. with like Instagram lately. And so let me, so let me, I'm going to put you on the spot here because I want to see the higher level thinking. So Instagram shuts down tomorrow. Okay. But here's, but here's the, but here's the point of the question, right? What lessons did you have you learned from Instagram as a marketer that you can now take to either another platform or in person that you didn't know before? Because this is the key. Because all I uh, all I know, and I want I want to hear your answer. I'm curious. All I know is that at some point it's going to change. It doesn't mean that you don't ride it while it's hot. I'm riding Instagram too for this business. But the most important thing is the marketing lessons because that you can take to wherever. So what what are the lessons you've learned? Yeah, in terms of mitigating risks, I'm I'm doing my best right now. Um, I'm trying to convert or not convert, transfer all my Instagram people to the CRM, and I've had a lot of success doing that the last so, couple of months. So step one, step one is any lead generation. So I, as I'll translate that and and give some higher level. Okay, whether it's Instagram, whether it's a gym, whether it's a run, that the the most important thing is getting the lead and capturing the lead. So taking that. So as Tito's talking about putting the lead into his own platform, because those are, that's his list. He owns it. And so whatever, and we see this all the time, people go to races and they do all these, they do all these marketing activities, but they don't capture information. So that, I think that's, that's a fantastic lesson of you get the information and you, you house the information because Instagram's rented space. Like it could shut down tomorrow, but your list, you own that. Good. What's next? Um, in terms of like just the marketing that I would take from like what I'm doing on Instagram, it's basically think of marketing as in like everything's a test Mm -hmm. basically. And basically whenever I talk, I talk to like in a video, it's just, I'm like talking to one person, but it's all like a test and see which marketing message resonates. And then that same concept, I can take it to basically another platform or an in-person. It's like, okay, this conversation that I had with this person on based on this video that they resonated with, let me do use that same messaging for this other type of in-person marketing. I love it. No, I think it's fantastic because the, 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 like I said, the only thing that I know is that the platforms will change and that doesn't mean you shouldn't use them. But the, what the thing would make me nervous as a business, let's just say I was an investor in Tito's business. I would be nervous if Tito, if I was concerned that Instagram was why he's gotten busy, right? Instagram isn't why Tito got busy with leads. Tito is why Tito got busy. It just so happens that Instagram is the vehicle to show that. But to me, and I think this is a great lesson for everyone, is that I know the platforms will change. I know the audience might change. The world might change. But the principles of marketing right? The principles of how do you attract the lead, of how do you differentiate yourself, how do you communicate, those will never change. Those will never change. It doesn't matter if chat GPT, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, email, right? The platform will change, but the principles of it won't. And I think for me, that's the most valuable piece of, of all of this is that you kind of can zoom out and say, all right, what, what did I learn here, right? And I've learned lessons similarly with Instagram, you know, I always kind of talk to you guys about how I know my marketing is working when someone DMs me and said, I felt like you were talking to me, right? It doesn't have to be Instagram. It happens right now that it is, but at some point, maybe it's email. Maybe there's another platform that comes about, right? If I speak in front of an audience, I'm thinking the same thing. How do I get the audience while I'm speaking to think like, oh my God, he knows me, 
right? So it doesn't matter the platform. I think that's that's a really really valuable lesson. So I'm I'm happy that you're you know exploring that and and being able to to utilize that. Um, I think it's a it's a great it's a great thing. Um, where do you want the business to go, right? So you're growing the business, you're getting busy, right? We've talked about managing your own schedule, but what's the goal? It's that's a tough question because I feel like I'm the type of person that I always want to grow. That's like the only thing, that, not the only thing, the thing that excites me the most. So I know that whenever I get to the goal that I kind of set myself, it's like, okay, so what's next? Well, that's the point though, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's like, where do I want to take it right now? I just want to grow myself, mm-hmm. grow a staff soon, and then hopefully grow together and see where we kind of take it. Right. Obviously milestones, milestones along the way. Um, but I just want to grow and see how much I can help the community. Right. I obviously believe in what I do. I know that it works and I just, I love doing it. Yeah. I can, I can see that and in, in talking to you and maybe me talking through this will help someone in the audience. I've never, I never got the sense with you that it was like a number financially. It's like, I do want to make more money, but I'm, I enjoy other things more. Like I enjoy the process of going through it and kind of being in the thick of it is, is like playing the game, so to speak. Right. And that's, that's me as well. And I've always observed that. And, um, you know, when I, when I see like, new business owners or like fledgling businesses that are getting going. That's one of the mindsets or something that I'm very aware of because you can see some people, they're like so driven to like get to a financial number. And the, the issue with that kind of like you said, but it's, it's worse is that inevitably I know they're going to get to it. And when they do, they're not going to still not going to be happy because it wasn't about that in the first place. And so I think, you know, if I've observed anything with you, it's, it's that you really do enjoy what you're doing. You enjoy the process. You're not satisfied with where you are, but, um, it's, it looks, it observes like, to me, it looks like you're, you're extremely happy, sort of like going through the shit, so to speak. And, and I think, um, for myself, at least the, one of the, the nice things is even the bad parts. Like I actually like, you know, there's yeah. some stuff you don't like, but even the stuff that I don't like, I kind of like doing it because it's a challenge and it's fun. And um, yeah, it, always. And, but, it, but, you know, I never, I didn't really start there. Um, it's yeah. like a learning process that I kind of posted today about writing this book and it's like brutal. It's like really hard, but <laughs> at the same time, it's like great because it is hard and, and I do enjoy it. So, and then I've observed that in you as well. Uh, last thing, you know, at our master, at our Fort Lauderdale mastermind, we gave out three awards and, and the one, the award that you received that day was the consistency award. You use that word a few times today. And it's something that I think all business owners, no matter how long or short they've been in business could learn from you. Give us a little more context on being consistent, whether it's with marketing or whether it's with your sales process, or even in our mastermind with showing up, um, you know, what, what is that? What, what advice would you give to somebody out there who might struggle to be consistent with the marketing or the sales or, or to just grow the business? Yeah, it's a couple of things. I know I'm really big fan of the Hormozis as I know you are, and I'm sure other business owners are. And I've, I've always been like this. I don't know. My parents is like, they taught me this and I know that I've always been like this in school and baseball. Um, but a couple quotes that the Hormozzi said that was, if it's worth doing once, it's like worth doing forever. And if it's not worth, if it's not worth doing it forever, then it's not even worth doing it once. Right. So whenever you pick on doing something, it's like, you gotta be consistently doing it. Right. Cause you're never going to know if it works or if it doesn't work. And the other thing that uh, you talk about this a lot, that I will never lose if I don't, stop or if I don't quit. Yeah. Right. And it's just got to be consistently doing everything right. Consistently with marketing, sales, communication, your growth, and just everything. That's how you don't lose if you don't stop. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, that, that last quote's big for me. And, um, I think it is like it, you know, I think that's a competitive advantage for you and, and one that resonates with me. 
I was listening to a podcast today and they were, they were talking about how they observe entrepreneurs and what is it the skill that the one guy has? And, and um, if you asked me that question, it was that I don't know if I'm the cl- most clever or like whatever, but I just know that I'll probably outlast you. Like, I'll just do it longer than you will. And I just won't stop. Like it just won't. And so it's going to be hard to beat me because I won't, I won't stop doing it. Whereas yeah. you see so many people, uh, they start on an Instagram business and then they're out and then they start to practice and then they get bored or they start down this route and then they figure something else out. And so, you know, you can, you can, if you're willing to play the game long enough, you, uh, you know, you, you can be pretty successful. You can be successful in other ways too, but, um, you know, for me, that's been, it's been one of them and then you as well. Um, Tito, where can the audience find you? So my Instagram at Kinesis Chiropractic or my website, Kinesis Um, yeah, those are pretty much the two main things where people can find me. Any questions I didn't ask that I should have? Not that I can think of. I'm. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Been a fan of the show since. I mean, since you first started. So it's it's an honor that I'm here. So I really appreciate it. Well, you are a valued member of our community, and as you may suspect we talk about all of our mastermind members and you are always one that is talked about in a positive light. Um, so we appreciate you being part of our community and a, a very valuable contributor and someone who we're looking at as a leader that is going to help grow himself, but then the profession and then eventually have a team. So uh, you, you've you been someone that's been very helpful to us and, and we look to you as someone who's a leader in our group of who just does it the right way. So thank you for that. Awesome. Thank, thank you for the words. I, I really appreciate it. They, they mean a lot more than you know. So thank you. Awesome, man. Well, thanks so much. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye, right, man. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. And if you found this content valuable, here are four ways I can help you for free. One, grab a copy of my free guide, the Rehab Chiropractor's Checklist. You can get that at go.drjustinrabinowitz.com slash guide. That's go.drjustinrabinowitz.com slash guide. Two, go ahead and give me a follow on Instagram at Justin Rabinowitz, where I post business content. Three, subscribe to my weekly newsletter by sending me an email at coaching at strive to move.com. And four, leave us a five star review so we can gain access to more influential people and bring those lessons back to you.